All right. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm not sure that I've ever seen 9 a.m. at FOSDEM, so <laughs> uh, thank you all for coming to talk about every developer's favorite topic I know, licensing. Um, and I have never uh, been able to participate in the JavaScript room here before, so I want to thank the organizers for having me and giving me the opportunity to, to talk about it. Um, and I didn't know that the opening keynote in advance was going to start this topic going, but that's, uh, as the introduction said, kind of set things up for us to talk here today. Um, I'm the executive director at the Free Software Foundation. I've actually worked at the foundation since 2003 in different capacities. I've been the executive director there since 2011. Uh, and as part of that, I work with all of the different teams of the FSF, including the uh, technical team with our systems administrators and web developer and our licensing staff as well. Um, so try to help them uh, work together to advance the FSF's interests and freedom uh, for the web and elsewhere. So I've talked about this topic in licensing-focused settings before. I've never talked about it in the JavaScript developer-focused setting before, so definitely a big part of what I'm here for today is to hear back from you at the end about uh, whether what I'm presenting here makes any sense at all from your perspective, and then uh, if you know possibly other ways where we could accomplish the same goals um, besides the system that I'm going to present here. So I'll try to save some time at the end for that. Uh, and if we don't get to your ideas, then please do follow up with me afterward, either by email um, or I'll be around the conference the rest of the day, of course. So at the Free Software Foundation, our goal is to um, not just make free software better, but to make all, free, all software free software. So in our perfect world, there's no proprietary software. It's all free. So of course, we have the problem right now that was uh, mentioned in the keynote yesterday. We have now... Uh, laptops and desktops, workstations that run all free software, uh, require no proprietary drivers or proprietary blobs. Even the boot firmware on this laptop is free software. And the FSF has certified um, machines that meet those criteria uh, under our Respects for Freedom program. But despite the fact that we might run one of these systems, we're asked to run non-free software, and in fact are running non-free software still every day. And the main way that happens is by proprietary JavaScript being delivered to the user in the web browser. Uh, and so Richard Stallman called this the JavaScript trap in an article that he published in 2009, um, which was referring to his 2004 article back when Java was uh, proprietary and the, uh, it was the Java trap. I don't think I have to tell uh, you all that JavaScript is basically an assumption on the web now. Uh, you can't do much of anything if you turn it off or block it. Um, Mozilla in 2013 removed the option that had been there you know, for a long time for users to disable JavaScript. And I understood, I wasn't happy about that, but I understood why they did it because users were unchecking that box and then reporting all sorts of bugs that were happening when sites weren't working properly, not realizing that they had um, disabled JavaScript. But it's just an indication of how required and assumed JavaScript on the web is. Now, at the FSF, we don't want to avoid all JavaScript, of course. We only want to avoid proprietary JavaScript. So this isn't necessarily a problem for freedom reasons. People might object to it for accessibility or other reasons. But for freedom reasons, not necessarily a problem as long as the JavaScript that's required is actually free. Unfortunately, JavaScript programs are generally not free. Um, and in particular, they're not free as they're typically distributed to the user. So we know there's all kinds of uh, very popular free software JavaScript frameworks out there where the site operator or the web developer can uh, get a copy of jQuery, it's free software. Um, but the way that these programs are then served to the user in their browser uh, doesn't meet the requirements of free software, even if that software is available elsewhere under a free license. So what do I mean by that? Um, the two basic requirements for something to be free software you have to tell the user it's free software in some fashion because otherwise, around the world, the default copyright is all rights reserved. Um, and so it's proprietary by default if there's no notice to the contrary. Uh, and then you also have to provide the complete and corresponding source code. So we know that permissive licenses, like the expat license, allow, commonly called the, the MIT license, allow people to redistribute that software in binary form if they want to. Uh, they're allowed to do that under the license, but if that's how they do it, then that's not free software. 
uh, it's free software if the source code still comes with it. So the failure to do these two things is are the, are the reasons why most JavaScript is non-free. So we know minified JavaScript is not really source code. That's not the preferred form for modification. It's not quite as um, difficult to work with as a true binary, but it's essentially the same thing. You know, if you are debugging something or trying to make a modification, minified JavaScript is not going to uh, do you any favors. So because minified, the, because people serve JavaScript minified and for all the performance reasons uh, that they typically do, that means they're not normally giving users the source form, which means it's not free software. Uh, this hurts users. Um, we shouldn't uh, wait for proprietary software. So we're talking about sort of two different cases here. I should be clear about that. One I would call kind of the unintentionally non-free case. And these are the cases where people are trying to use a free software JavaScript framework or a free software JavaScript, but they're just not giving users the source and they're not providing clear license notice. That's one category. Uh, the other category is JavaScript that's deliberately proprietary. So things like uh, Google Analytics, or you know, the JavaScript for G Gmail or Google Docs, uh, that JavaScript is intentionally not free. Right? So it's important to keep these two different cases in mind. Uh, in the second case, we know from the history of free software versus proprietary software all the terrible things that can happen to people as a result of proprietary software. Uh, the same things can happen as a result of proprietary JavaScript that happen as a result of proprietary C or Python or uh, anything else. We have an unfortunately expanding collection on gnu.org slash philosophy slash proprietary of all these examples, um, not just JavaScript, but other things as well. So if you're ever trying to explain to somebody why proprietary software is harmful, that's a, a good resource. Uh, run through these quickly because I know you're all familiar with the fact that JavaScript can do these things, but uh, you know, we know that JavaScript can modify the copy-paste buffer, so you, the user might think they're copying something and then they paste it into their terminal and it's rm-rf and there you go. Uh, block browser functions like saving images, sort of the poor person's DRM. Um, record your keystrokes. Uh, this is one that a lot of people don't realize. It's gotten a little bit of press. There's kind of an, uh, a story about how Facebook was recording what users were typing, even if they didn't post it in the end. Uh, but uh, also another story recently about how customer service online chat uh, typically actually shows your keystrokes to the representative on the other side without telling you that. Uh, and then we know that JavaScript can be used, of course, to deliver malware uh, within the browser. And there was one example some years ago that was used to uh, exploit Tor. Uh, but it's also the other side. It's not just about avoiding attacks or mistreatment of malware. It's about enabling the power of free software on the web, just as we you know, had that power and that dynamic and that culture uh, before, you know, before JavaScript was such a popular thing on the web on your own system. Uh, I know there's... You know, this all kind of started with Grease Monkey, I think, and then it turned into several different sites, repositories, where people are sharing JavaScript that can modify the behavior of different popular sites, you know, or do different um, cool things in the browser. Open User JS is one that I know of, and they're actually seem to be making like a pretty strong effort to uh, license the job, make sure all the JavaScript there is actually freely licensed, which was nice to see. But you know, the point is, we're trying to not just stop the negative effects of proprietary JavaScript are also trying to sort of move to a new model of the web that embraces user freedom to modify the behavior of you know, what it, how a site acts in their browser um, with the cooperation of the site operator and everybody involved. So if we're going to do that, we have to meet the basic requirements for free software, so we have to provide source. Um, this is the system that the FSF has developed. It's called, we call it JavaScript Web Labels. And I'm going to walk through the different components of that. Uh, the first is a stylized comment to include in your JavaScript files to point to the source URL. Um, and it's our, you know, we, we've stated publicly that we believe doing the following things will. Um, be in compliance with the uh, GNU GPL's requirement to distribute source code. So, you know, we've had a particular challenge with copyleft and GPL covered JavaScript because if you read the requirements in a certain way, you might think that you have to distribute a copy of a full copy of the GPL with every JavaScript file that you serve to a user, um, and that can be, you know, possibly pretty burdensome. Um, and also, you know, how do you 
properly serve or offer the source code to the user in order to meet the GPL's requirements. So um, these source code source uh, comment formats work for that. Um, and then after that, indicate the license of the JavaScript code. And we have a couple, two different ways of doing that. The first way is actually embedding the, or putting the license notice in the file um, using a comment of that format. Of course, if you're the copyright holder of the JavaScript, you can actually use a license exception uh, to make this even easier for other people. So using GBL v3's additional permission uh, feature, you can distribute non-source. You can add an a additional permission worded like this. Um, you may distribute non-source, e.g. minimize or compacted forms of this code without the copy of the GNU GPL normally required by section four, provided you include this license notice and a URL through which recipients can access the corresponding source. So if you're the copyright holder of, of, of JavaScript that you wrote, then you have the power to um, add an additional permission to the license. You of course can't do that if you're modifying somebody else's JavaScript uh, under a free license because you have to have their permission in order to change the license terms. Uh, but this is a clean way to handle it if you're the copyright holder because it leaves no doubt about the GPL requirements for providing the copy of the license and the corresponding source. It lets people know that they can, uh, it's okay for them to not distribute um, the copy of the license and as long as they provide a link to the source code. But you're probably not the copyright holder for most of the JavaScript that you're working with. Uh, this format was actually announced all the way back in 2012. We're going to talk about how it's doing since then. Um, the full description of it is in slash licenses JavaScript dash labels on GNU.org. The goal of the system is twofold. First of all, it's to be machine readable uh, so that it can be read, licensing information can be read and processed by browser extensions or, uh, or server tools. Uh, but the second thing is it really does need to be human readable. You know, if you think to the GPL's basic requirement or most free software licenses uh, basic requirement that you, you need to tell the person that what they're receiving is free software. You, wanna, it's a, you need to inform them of the rights they have over the software. And so this isn't strictly a machine readable format. It's something that humans are supposed to be able to read and understand as well. So it starts with adding a link in the somewhere on the site, typically in the footer with other copyright information. This is fsf.org, link called JavaScript licenses. Uh, when you follow that link, sorry, you mark that link with an attribute, rel equals js license. That's part of the machine readable automated tool portion. So this is just, this is part of the approach because it means that any page the user loads, there's a standard place, a standard link that should lead to the licensing information. That link leads to something that looks like this. It's a simple HTML table in a specific format. Uh, the, you have the file that's being served to the user. So for example, the minified version. In the center, you have the license. And at the end, you have the source, the corresponding source. This shows you the format of the table. So the table uh, columns are given specific IDs, again, to facilitate the processing by uh, tooling. I uh, showed you FSF to start with, of course, but um, uh, it has been adopted by some other organizations and some other sites. Um, I'm gonna talk more about how that adoption is going <laughs> in a minute, but uh, just to show an example from Electronic Frontier Foundation, it's pretty cool that they picked it up and started doing it. They're very supportive of uh, free software, obviously generally for their work, um, but they went out of their way to make sure that they adopted this as well for the JavaScript that they were using. I think this is a screenshot of their old site, but I confirmed um, last night that it's still there. When, after they went through their site redesign, they still have it. And in fact, 
they have a lot of their JavaScript licenses under the AGPO, which I thought was excellent. Uh, so automation based on this format. You could imagine any number of tools uh, that did interesting things with it, but the one that we focused on is called GNU Libre JS. It's a GNU project. Uh, it's a browser plugin for Mozilla-based browsers that um, looks for this format and licensing information on sites when you visit them, and if it doesn't find it, it blocks the proprietary JavaScript on the page. So it looks for that web labels uh, information, and for any JavaScript that has the corresponding source link and a corresponding license that's free, and it has a system for recognizing the license, licenses, it will allow that JavaScript through, um, and anything else it will block. Uh, people know NoScript, right, to, to generally block all JavaScript, uh, but this is a, a different, more targeted approach. So, like I said, it happened in 2012 that we started pushing for this. How's it going? I would have to say, not that good. Um, why? Well, uh, some of the reasons are a bit mundane. So LibreJS is a piece of software for uh, a long period of time was not working very well. Uh, and it was hard for us to persuade people to adopt a particular format um, that has you know, the aims of being machine readable and, and useful without any corresponding you know, high functioning tool to actually use that format. Uh, and you know, people that are operating and, and taking care of big sites with a lot of JavaScript and a lot of pages, um, you know, you, if you can't give them a tool to go through and test the site, and it becomes quite a bit of work for them to go through and make sure that everything is done properly and according with the format uh, by hand. Then there were the updates to the Mozilla extension system, um, which broke LibreJS further. So it took us too long to react to this and catch up to it. Uh, the good news is that um, it was rewritten. And from all reports, it's now working pretty well. Uh, there were also some performance issues with it. You know, It's trying to go through every JavaScript file and see what the license is. Uh, and so it would have to do that for every you know, file before letting the page proceed. Um, there's been a lot of performance improvements. I encourage you to try it out and give us some feedback on it. Uh, and there are still further challenges coming. The changes that Google was talking about making to the Chrome uh, extension system, uh, the API, will basically make plugins like this almost impossible, maybe impossible, um, because they're taking away the ability for plugins to modify the content on the page. Uh, it's also going to cause problems for NoScript and, and a lot of other uh, plugins that people have come to rely on. Um, so I imagine uh, people might be wondering, why didn't you do it some other way? And I'm hoping to hear um, some of your ideas for how licensing information can be presented that satisfies those two goals of machine readable and human readable. Um, we do not claim this to be the one true method. We didn't go through a big public, public comment or kind of standards development process in order to come up with this. Uh, we wanted to get something out there to start with because this problem even in 2012 was so bad for free software and it's only gotten worse since then. Uh, but, you know, plugins like LibreJS could easily support multiple systems um, and there's no reason why you can't have multiple systems. There's no reason why we can't you know, experiment with some different ones and settle on another one. I know there's been some proposals using RDF, some using HTTP headers, uh, or getting attributes uh, like for licensing tags added to the script elements itself, or using custom attributes, or I think there's a the potential maybe with JavaScript source maps. Uh, I saw the great news the other day that Ruby on Rails is going to be turning source maps on by default. Um, so I think there's some potential there. But you know, we're not going to wait for the perfect system to keep pushing forward uh, ways to help people serve JavaScript in a free way and help users receive it in a free way. So let's point to some next steps. Uh, LibreJS improvements. I mentioned that a lot of them have happened. Um, it was the, uh, Giorgio, the author of uh, NoScript, who helped us get that done. Uh, but there are more things that need to be done. We all have more uh, wish lists and feature requests for it. Uh, mobile devices, you know, the primary way people browse the web now. Uh, the good news about this is I'm hoping, you know, fingers crossed, that we will have an Android version available within the next few months that will work with um, Firefox or IceCAD or any Mozilla-based uh, browser on Android. 
Uh, it won't be on the iPhone because the App Store is not very friendly to free software. Uh, then the next step after that for us is to have a command line or automated testing version of LibreJS. So even for us at the FSF, it's kind of a problem. We work really hard to maintain clear licensing information for our JavaScript, but we also use you know, upstream platforms. We use Drupal, we use CVCRM, we use MediaWiki. Uh, and anytime there's a change uh, or an upgrade, sometimes the web label system breaks, there's a new JavaScript or something changes. And you know, we don't necessarily find out about that unless we manually check it or somebody reports the problem to us. So we know that uh, something that people realistically need in order to actually adopt this is an automated way to test it, an easy way without browsing to every individual page on your site. Um, that's the next priority after the mobile version. Uh, something that I'm hoping people in this room might have ideas about or be able to help with is how to modify or make you know, the right sensible defaults or features in the tool chains uh, and, and the tooling that are popularly used in the JavaScript community to make a format like this for minified JavaScript kind of just happen automatically um, or you know, other ways that the tooling could be modified in order to do better at providing licensing information and links to corresponding source code. Uh, and then, you know, we, we can't just demand that upstream projects make changes in order to, you know, fix licensing information. If we want that, we want to help them. Um, and that's something that we have done at the FSF. We've sent some patches upstream to, I think, Etherpad and some other projects um, to help the LibreJS, or the, sorry, the web labels and uh, JavaScript licensing information get upstream. Um, you know, you can imagine there's a lot of projects that if they started doing that, they're in such wide use, it would make just a huge difference. Um, on so many different sites where those frameworks or those platforms are being used, they would be uh, properly free right out of the box. Uh, and then we need, on the user side, we need awareness campaigns. You know, on both sides, user and the site operator side, we need awareness campaigns um, in a friendly way, especially because when I mentioned those two problem areas, the, you know, the intentionally non-free, but also the unintentionally non-free, especially in that case with unintentional, um, we need to take a very friendly approach and a constructive approach, but emphasize the importance of this, that this is software that's running on our local machine and needs to be free just like any other software that we run locally. Uh, so I would love to hear uh, your feedback, your ideas, your comments about this. Um, has anybody in the room tried uh, adding web labels to their site before? We got one. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what do people think? about that method of, of providing license information. Uh, wouldn't the link to the standard license uh, suffice instead of putting uh, the text in the comment? Uh, so would a link to the standard license suffice instead of putting a lot of uh, text and a comment? Um, the only text that we're recommending, so two things, um, you don't need the uh, comment in the file if you're using the web label system. So if you have that separate table that provides the correspondence between the file, the license, and the source code, then you don't need to add anything else to the file. Um, you only need the comment in the file if you're not doing the full web label system. Uh, but even if you're putting the comment in the file, what we're encouraging people to do is just to put that basic statement about the license in the file, the, like the short version of the GPL boilerplate, for example, um, that you typically see in a source file because a uh, link to the license isn't really doing a great job of telling the user what, you know, at least the summary that this is free software and you can freely copy it and share it and modify it. So that's nice to have there. But uh, you don't need to worry about it at all if you do the web label. Uh, 